<laughs> okay. Um, the the um, when we say we're a friend of God, I just went onto Webster's and just found the definition for friend. Now listen to this: a friend is one who is attached to another by affection, one who entertains for another's sentiments of esteem. Okay, so God was the first one to call us friend. So he was attached to us by affection. And that he said to people that did not even believe. So I call you, my friend. I want to acknowledge to you that I am attached to you by affection. Okay? One who entertains for another sentiments of esteem. Okay, so he was entertaining us to the point that we can esteem who he is. Because if we can esteem who he is, we can see who we are. For we've been made in his image and in his likeness. For his esteem, respect and affection, which leads him to desire his company. And to seek to promote his happiness and prosperity, opposed to a foreign enemy. So what a friend is, is somebody who seeks to promote somebody else's prosperity. He seeks to promote his happiness he wants to entertain him and be good to him until the other person says, I cannot live without this person's presence in my life. He's too good to me. That's a friend. And we are a friend of God, you know, because he first called us friends. He said, listen, man, I, I'm just good to you. And uh, the law has blinded our minds so that we could not see his friendship. And we try to interpret friendship with four definitions of slavery. You cannot do it. <laughs> it's impossible. Um, you know, so uh, uh, just know this. God's number one uh, uh, vision with you is to have you as a friend. Like I said last Sunday, um, for those of you that has not been here, God did not make man for the purpose of having servants. We don't have children so that we can have people to wash the floor or to clean the garden. That's not why we have kids. They might do it, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to have somebody to be our friend, to, uh, to have somebody that can inherit everything we possess. And actually, we have kids for the purpose of giving them everything we have worked for. That is a, that's why we have children. No other reason. I mean, that is, well, that's the main reasons why we have kids. So when God made Adam and Eve, He did not make them, uh, and they, they weren't created from a lack in God of having a need to be worshipped. God doesn't need your worship to exist. He can exist in Himself. Amen. We don't have kids to come to us every morning and tell us how beautiful we are and what good parents we are. That's not why we have children. We have children for this reason, and that is so that they can inherit everything we have and that we can serve them and be good to them. I speak to people, I said, man, you know, maybe it is easier once your kids are out of the house. They say, man, that's when the real care starts, you know. And uh, that's what a parent is. He's actually a servant of his children. And God made us for this purpose, and that is to have a good friendship with you, to love you, and we not to have slaves. Amen. We will do things in the kingdom of God, but it's a completely different basis. So if we come with a mindset of slavery, a mindset of law, of what must I do to get my master to smile over my life, well, if, you, if you've got that mindset, it will be very difficult to understand the Bible. It will be very difficult to hear what God is actually saying when He speaks to you. You know, I've been to uh, conferences where a prophet would stand up and uh, the person would be uh, really works orientated, you know. But when he prophesies, he hears God. He hears the voice of God. But when he interprets what he heard, it is interpreted with a definitions of slavery I will do a new thing amongst you for instance you know I want you to get rid of all iniquity in your life and unrighteousness says the Lord what does it mean it means what is iniquity 
What is unrighteousness? Iniquity and unrighteousness is thinking you're justified by your works. So God's word can clearly be defined in the parameters of his love and easily be interpreted. But when you've got a law mindset, you cannot even, you can hear the voice, but you cannot hear what he's really saying. Amen. I want to heal you. What does it mean? You know, the, he wants to heal the broken heart and all those kind of things. It means, I want to apply my love to your life. So put on the glasses of God's unconditional love and look at the Bible, look at the voice that you hear God speaks to you and you will know what He says. For God is love, the language He speaks is love. Even if you can move a mountain but you have no love, you're nothing. So what makes God God is the love that's in Him for you. Amen. Right. Um, I want to just lay a little bit of a foundation and then we're going to go to James and we're going to continue in the book of James for the next Sundays until we've finished. <laughs> I don't know how long it will take. And um, there are some scriptures in the book of James that's difficult to understand. Right. Luke chapter 4 verse 18 and 19 says the following. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. He has set at liberty them, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to, te to, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So he says here, and, and I want to focus on the first part, he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, um, in the Jewish mind, the, the, you, can, you could actually not preach the gospel to the poor. Because the poor were the cursed ones. Because Deuteronomy 28 said, If you obey all my commandments, then these blessings shall come over you. Okay? So if you're obedient, then these blessings shall come over you. So if you were poor, it meant you weren't obedient and you weren't blessed by God. You were under the curse. So now how can you come and preach the gospel? And what is the gospel? The message that you are made righteous by Him. That you are and co-heir with Christ. That the kingdom is given to you. How can the kingdom be given to the poor? To those that are actually cursed by disobedience. they disobedient... They're not the blessed of God. God's hand of blessing is not upon them. And now God enables the Messiah to come and tell those that has been disqualified by the law that they are blessed, equally blessed with, the bless with Jesus, with the Messiah. You could not preach the gospel to the poor, not in a law mindset. The poor first has to repent of his sins, Get the blessing of God on him and then you can declare him blessed. But Jesus comes and he justifies the ungodly. Those that are ungodly says you just, you are the righteous one. Not because of your doing but because of my doing. Okay, so that is what he, what he came to do. He has sent me to heal the broken heart. That broken heart, it means the belief system that has been broken by bringing in works righteousness and definition by who you are and what happens to you into your belief. Our belief in the beginning, Adam's belief was this. I am who God is. For God's breath is in me and I am who I am because God in me makes me who I am. Okay, so I'm actually like an empty shell with God inside. So if you want to say, see who I really am, who God is, is who I am. That is the belief that God created man with. That's the belief that God came to restore in Christ. Now, uh, 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 your heart is your belief machine. So, Jesus came to heal the broken hearted. So when Adam came and he fell under the doctrine of Satan by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this belief was broken. Our hearts, the Bible says, with a heart we believe unto righteousness. Our hearts were broken. And Jesus came to heal our hearts. Amen. He came to heal your heart. Right, let's go to James now. <clears throat> Have in mind about this, the poor and those kind of things. It says, a little bit of background on James again. <clears throat> uh, uh, James wrote to Jews that were scattered 
They lived in different towns. They believed in Jesus, became part of the church system, um, you know, and, and uh, were believers in grace. Then they were persecuted for righteousness sake. They were persecuted because they believed in the gospel of God's unconditional love. They did not believe in works righteousness anymore. They did not believe in tithing to be blessed anymore. They did not believe in circumcision to be part of the household of God. They did not believe that um, they were children of Abraham because of, the f of physical genealogy. They believed that they were children of God because Jesus was the offspring that was promised to Abraham. That's what they believed. They believed they were the spiritual Israel, not physical anymore. But now, the physical, the bondage people, the, the Jews of that time, would persecute their brothers. You know? They would kill some of them. They would uh, um, excommunicate them out of the synagogues. And then they were treated like the heathen. Meaning, if you would get in, if, if that Jew that became a Christian would touch another Jew, he will have to go through a cleansing process because he's treated like the heathen. He's treated like a cursed one. You could not do business with him. Um, he was completely cast out. Family ties were broken. They did not have friends. It was a very lonely and difficult situation they were going through. Okay? And now the book of James was written to these Jews because these Jews wanted to go back. These believers wanted to go back to Judaism because life was so difficult. Okay, right. That's the context. Then we go to James 1 verse 5. It says, If any one of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who give to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Now, <clears throat> He says to the Jewish person, or these people we can take into our life today, if any of, what, of you need wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given unto him. Okay, now the wisdom he talks about here is basically, when you are in the message of God's unconditional love, and you're going through a hard time, you might be tempted to get out of this message, to get the thing, to get back to a life where it just goes maybe a little bit better for a while, you know, and reject what you believe. And you don't know what to do. How shall I continue in this belief of God's unconditional love? And I'll give you a good example now. How will I continue in this? Give me wisdom, O God. How will I apply the finished work of Jesus that when I'm in the situation that I know how to go about, what to do in my situation without denying the finished work of Jesus and going back into works righteousness? That's what he's saying there. If you need wisdom, ask of God. And then he gives two wonderful keys. Who gives liberally, in other words, you, know, you won't have to do something to get it. Or another way of saying it, he gives it in the atmosphere of liberty. He will point out liberty and freedom. He'll give it to you free. And abradeth not. Now, abradeth there, in the Afrikaans, is, is the best translation for me of that word. It says, hy verweit nie. Om te verweit means... You take account of the past. Okay? No, no, no. You've done it this and this and this way, and I'm recalling the past, and on the basis of the past, I'm now going to tell you what you must do. Now, the Jewish people here, they were thinking the best way, the best wisdom there is in this situation is to go back to the past. And obviously, they had preachers that came around telling them, listen, just be wise. Compromise. Go back to the old law Jewish system. Just have your children circumcised. This is the advice of God. Do you think God wants you to be persecuted like this? So just go back to the old Jewish system. You know, have your kids circumcised. Ask them for forgiveness. Just believe in Jesus in your heart. You know, you don't have to show you're a Christian. Follow the Jewish traditions. You're going to be out of your trouble, out of your problems. But in your heart, you still believe in Jesus. This was the advice and the context in which this was written. Then he came, James came and he said, listen, if you go through a hard time and you're persecuted for the gospel's sake, God will never give you advice by recalling the past. 
pointing to the law. So, let's, let, let's take a financial situation. You are struggling financially, and I've seen it with, with preachers. Um, some of my good friends, you know, this is just, I'm just talking about experience. I think of my own life even. You know, when, when people were preaching, tithing, sowing and reaping in the church, it was financially much better for them. Because the people gave. The, the message that was preached kept them away from receiving the fullness of God's love. And then there was a desire for that fullness in the people's heart. Then what he said is, if you tithe or sow or reap or do those kind of things, then you will be blessed and prosper. Okay? So the hunger for God was used as the motivator for giving. And that's why people gave. Because we want God, man. Everything, we, we want His presence. We want His blessing. We want His love. And then that strong desire is almost like taking water away from somebody. And then when he's very thirsty, you tell him five things to do and then you'll give him water. He'll do anything because of his desire to survive. So mankind cannot live without the water of God's love and acceptance and God's blessing. And now when you sit under a message where it's preached, you are not, you need to become, then you want to become that. You want to live in a place where you are a friend of God. You want to live in a place where you're not a slave but a son. You want to live in a place where you are an heir. Amen. Now, if you don't have that, there's a desire for it, like for water. And then, if you tithe, if you sow and reap, if you do, then you will be blessed. People give. So you find great prosperity, great financial giving. can't actually call it prosperity. Just call it a lot of money. A lot of money coming to the church. Now, grace is preached, God's influence, and that this manipulation thing cannot work anymore. Now, the people preach it. Some of my friends, even myself, you preach it, and you see a lot of people stop to give. Okay? In the beginning, it's normally like that. They stop to give. Now, you are suffering. Now, this suffering, now, God, we need wisdom. Then I have, you know, <laughs> speak to, 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 to some of my friends, my pastor friends, they will say, Bertie, you know, don't you think we can just go back to the tithing teaching again? I'm sure, I mean, there can't be so much wrong with it. It's like I'm getting wisdom from God, from a God that recalls the past. God, what must I do? God says, well, I gave Jesus and everything. In the financial area, it seems it doesn't work. You know, just go back to the tithe quickly. It will work. That's not the wisdom of God. So I want to tell you, when you've made a step into the grace message, and this is what, what he's trying to say here, and those that watch by the internet, uh, I know some people will go through hard times, especially leaders. You know, people will not come to the church so much, you know, because uh, there's maybe a stage of rebellion or something, you know. The wisdom God gives you will never be to go back to the past of manipulation and control. That is what he says here. If any one of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives without taking account of the past. The Bible says, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. It doesn't mean, oh, God's going to kick you out. It just means you are not following the way it works in the kingdom of God. God is not looking back. Remember Lot's wife. She was not allowed to look back. We don't look back to the old system of law. We don't look back to the old system of salt. We are looking to, we are the light of the world. Amen. So what we do is, all that we do, we look forward. We're not going to say, oh God, how, where did I, maybe I shouldn't have left that old principle there. Remember this, when we get, and especially for those watching on the internet as well, um, the reason why I say this is, when, when the message of God's love is preached in a, a, a church, sister, ch church, for instance, if people invite me to preach in a church, and I know that this church people don't really stand for the grace message, and I got in there in some way, I'll rather say to the pastor, 
can't I just speak to you alone? You know? And just teach you what I believe. Because if I stand in the church and I preach it, he will feel whooped in front of his people. So you need to, need to use a little bit of wisdom. But what will happen is, if the people hear it, it can bring the vision in the church. And now the message of grace is seen as a message. This message just brings a split in the church. This cannot be from God. But Jesus said, I have not come to bring peace but the sword. He says it. He says, which will bring the vision between a mother and a daughter. So if one person believes the love of God and another person does not believe therein, what will happen? Who causes the division? Definitely not the grace. The grace is the truth. The others decide to break away from the true message. Amen. That is actually what is, what is happening. So uh, um, we can never look back. We can never say this thing doesn't work. It is the only truth. And this is what he says here. We read on. He says, I want to go to 1 first, uh, first Corinthians 1. It says this. Uh, Paul writes, he says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom... For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, that is a, sounds so difficult. <laughs> if, you read it, uh, if you read it, your corpse in it, zzz, you know. <laughs> but this, this is what it means. God says, after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Now. God came with a different kind of a wisdom. Mankind had a wisdom. Mankind's wisdom was, I'm going to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and this is my wisdom. If I can do good things, it means I am good. That's the wisdom of the world. If I can do good things, it means I am good. But the wisdom of God is different. The wisdom of God says this, if God can become a human being and the goodness of God can be inside Jesus as your representative, then you are good. That's the wisdom of God. Now it says, the wisdom of the, the, wisdom of the world, if you, the more you know about the wisdom of the world, the less you will know the wisdom of God. Now he says, if anyone needs wisdom, let him ask of God will not take account of the world's wisdom to give you advice in what you need to do in your difficult or hard situation. Now, uh, there can be many of you going through hard times. I don't know what to say to you in your situation. But what I do know is that the scripture says, ask God. Say, God, I want to have wisdom. What is the wisdom? Wisdom is the correct action or the correct application of Jesus his finished work and your full identity in who you are free from your works applied to that situation okay like let's take a, a business deal again or a relationship for instance you get people that are in a relationship and you know this is not a good relationship okay but you feel, I cannot leave this person because should I leave this person, it means, you know, that I am a bad person. That is the wisdom of the world. That's the wisdom of the world. Okay? The wisdom of God is something different. The wisdom of God says, in Christ you've been made the righteousness of God. So your action can never determine who you are. Should you stay or should you go does not determine who you are. Once you're in that wisdom, the mi your mind goes to rest. And the God will work an emotion born from Him in your heart. And that is what you know you'll have to do. Okay. Simple as that. It's like... Um, 
uh, 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 I, I, I got some advice, I hope this comes out right now, of changing some of my comments on Facebook to make it a bit softer, you know, because it's very radical. I say radical things. Um, and then I tried it for a day. <laughs> Doesn't work. I'll rather have a, a completely different strategy. I, it, it can't work because, and this was the advice, listen, you know, um, let's not make people upset. Rather explain yourself very well. Now there's wisdom in that, you know, in the sense of you don't want people upset unnecessarily. But they only allow, allow 500 characters in a comment. So I can't explain myself every time and I hate typing. So um, <clears throat> how am I going to do, I can't, and nobody reads three pages post. So what, what are you going to do? You know, if what you say is completely against another system. So, so, and then some other advice would be, listen, if you do this, you know, then people's not going to be upset and you'll have more doors for your ministry. Okay, now, that's the wisdom of the world. It's not God's wisdom. So wisdom of the world says, the bigger your ministry, the better. No, no, no. Ask of God, which will, if you know the wisdom of the world, you will not know the wisdom of God. God's wisdom says, Bertie, big or small doesn't matter. Okay, so once you get big or small out of your mind, once you get, well, the bigger you are, the more money you'll have in your ministry, the more you can do for God. It sounds like God's wisdom, but it is Satan's wisdom. It's the wisdom that is abrading, going back to the old system. Listen, this is God's word. It doesn't matter, matter how big your ministry is, doesn't matter how small it is, doesn't, that doesn't matter. You will always be cared for financially because who I am is who you are. Okay, so now once the money thing is sorted out, once the spreading of the gospel thing is sorted out, where I am not called to try and save the world, I just do what I can. Okay, and Jesus has been called to save the world. And he works in different people. It's not my job. Okay? Or anybody's job. You just do your part, which comes naturally to you. Once that is the thing, you've got peace, you've got joy, because you ask wisdom of God. God's wisdom, not the wisdom of the world. God's wisdom. And I realized, man, I can't change this thing. No. I just make my radical comments. If the door's closed, glory to God. If I'm not invited, glory to God. You know? Then I preach at home, my wife, a wedding here and there, I preach to you guys, I'm happy. Because we're not building a ministry. You see, once you get into the wisdom of God, meaning Christ applied to your life, you can make a God decision. Amen. The world by wisdom did not know God. Um, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 28 to 30, it says, And base thing of this world, and the things that are despised, has God chosen, yes, and the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. So what God did was, in the world system it says, the rich are the blessed of God, the, um, you know, the, 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 the people that's got everything going for them, they are the blessed of God, especially I find it a lot in churches as well, they are the blessed of God, but what, what he says here, God came and he destroyed that wisdom, and he took that which was nothing according to the world system, which was the cursed, and he came and he said, this is the righteousness of God free from their works, and destroyed the wisdom of the world, by using the nothing and making the nothing a something, even while they are a nothing in the world, my goodness, isn't that awesome? That makes the whole burden fall from you. Hallelujah. If I, if I, if I, I want to just testify out of my own life. You know, when I started in the gospel, you know, we suffered. And I, I just felt to, to touch a little bit on the financial thing, because I know many people struggle with, with, with finances. I suffered, you know. And I had people say to me, Bertie, it's because of what you preach about the tithe. You must get out of that. 
I'm giving you God's advice. And now, you know, when it, when it goes, when you go through a hard time and you get that advice, you know, it can be tempting. It can be tempting. Like with Jesus, when he was hungry, it was, he was tempted to do a stupid thing, which he knows is not the right thing. In the very same way, when you're in a hard time, you, I mean, you see your vrouw sitting with foot plat op the ground, wanneer is by mense keier, want as hulle oplig, steek haar toene onderuit, my broer. Dis sleg, ou man. So I mean, you, you tempted, I must do something to get the people to start to give, or I must leave the ministry, and go and work, and be angry at God, for He couldn't care for me. And all of that. When you're in that situation, you are tempted to go back to the old system. But I want to tell you, by simply saying, like the scripture says here, he says, look at the trustworthiness of your faith. You must get lost Sunday's message to explain the trustworthiness of your faith. Look at the trustworthiness of your faith, which is Jesus, and He shall bring it forth. I look at my life. The first thing that God gave me was contentment. Just to be happy where you are. Just to be happy. Not worrying, should it ever grow or not grow. I find, I found, and I've said it before, the house that we stayed in where we were mowing the lawn on the inside of the house. Okay? I'm making it a bit worse than what it is, but the grass did grow on the inside. Where the crack was so big that the wind blew through the wall. Okay? We lived in that house. When we lived there, we never thought it was an ugly house. We thought it's a nice house. It's like your, your eyes become blind to the things of this, the wisdom of this world. It means nothing. Th that's what God gave, you know. In this wisdom, He gives you that endurance, knowing what to do. And what I knew what to do was to stick to this simple gospel. And today, I'm living a good life. You know, I'm living a good life. I'm not a very rich person. I'm not a poor person. In, measured with money. I just live a normal life. I can my hemp kopen as I can wil hee, I can my car taai as op as I moet. Amen. Thank God, you know. If I need to go and preach somewhere, I can. Thank you, Jesus. And we live by this persuasion. I want to tell you, it doesn't matter what you go through, you don't think, Lord, since, and this is what people say to me, Bertie, since I went to the grace place, all hell broke loose. <laughs> You know why many times it happens? It's because you know that's the right thing, but in your heart, you still believe, oh, if I leave these things, I'll go through such a hard time. Yeah. Because you actually still, in your subconscious mind, believe in the old system. God, when He gives wisdom, you know, He does not give wisdom on the basis of um, uh, 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 going back to the old way. And I want to say this to you, and like Jesus said, don't believe me, because it happened to me. I mean, you can do it. This is what, what Jesus says. He says. Believe me for the word. Believe me for the truth of the gospel. Amen. If you struggle to do that, look at the testimony in my life. But that's the second thing. Because if you base your life on my testimony, let the testimony help you to go to the word. But if my test, what happens if I'm poor tomorrow? Are you then not going to believe in the gospel anymore? No. We believe in this word, and God does not use the wisdom of the world. So, if the pastor is rich or if the pastor is poor, means one thing. His life and what happens to him in this world is no indication of God's unconditional love for every man, and that God smiles over your life, that you're approved of God. Amen. Hallelujah, man. That gives me peace. Yeah. That gives me joy. Hallelujah. Then it goes on, it says here, But of him... You are in Christ, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So Jesus Christ was made by God for us wisdom. So what is, your, what is God's wisdom, God's wisdom uh, uh, to you? It's this. Who Jesus is is who you are. That's God's wisdom. That's the wisest thing you can ever think. It is the wisest thing that you can ever 
uh, 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 apply in your life into every, any area of your life. It is that. Amen. Now listen to this. He became, Jesus became our wisdom. He became our righteousness. If God wants to know how righteous you are, Jesus is your righteousness. And sanctification. And redemption. How are we sanctified? He is my sanctification. So if you get 20 steps on how, oh God, how am I going to be sanctified? Because I find in my life, I fluke, I drink, I rook, scalum, I do this, I do all these bad things. Huh? <laughs> I do all these sins. Oh God, what must I do to get rid of these things? And you want to go into all... Listen, this is God's view about your problem. Jesus is your sanctification. You are sanctified. But I attract no gedukseghaar. Listen, you are sanctified, my friend. You are sanctified. But how can it be? Look at my works. The wisdom, Jesus became the wisdom of God concerning you. If you want to be wise with the wisdom of God, say, His holiness is my holiness free from my works. And you will find <laughs> that this wisdom brings forth a change in your life. Amen. We are not saying you will never change. I'm just saying, let's not use the old wisdom, which was wisdom, which now is foolishness. You know, the quickest a person can become stupid is for Jesus to appear on the scene. If you're very wise in worldly things and Jesus appears, you're a fool in a second. You're a fool in a second. God sees your concentration. That's not faith. Faith means to be persuaded. Okay? of what Christ has done. Ask in this wisdom. In other words, ask in the persuasion of, written out to Jews, that you are not the seed of Abraham because of physical genealogy. If you need, a, 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 if you're in a financial crisis, you don't ask wisdom of God, or when you ask, you ask in faith, in the persuasion that He is the one that provides for you. He is your tithe. He was what was paid to get the curse away from your life. He is your blessing. You ask in faith, in the persuasion of what He has done. You ask. You inquire on that platform. Amen. That means to ask in faith. We don't believe four things. Those of you who have not listened to my series on faith, you need to get it. We don't believe four things. We believe in someone. Amen. Faith and four does not go together. Faith and in someone goes together. And then we have a hope for things. I was at a meeting in the week uh, and the lady asked me badly, but now how do we faith when it comes to healing? How do we faith for somebody to get healed or we, do we just hope he gets healed? You know, you know the word hope lost its power through the word of faith movement. We're not allowed to hope. The word hope in the Greek means a confident expectation of good things. That's hope. So I hope I get healed. I've got a confident expectation of healing. I hope that I will be blessed. I've got a confident expectation of God's provision for me every day. Amen. I hope that I'll be content. I've got a confident expectation that contentment is the basis of my life with everything. Amen. But my faith is towards what Christ has done. So what he says here, when you ask wisdom, ask on the basis of what Christ has done. A full persuasion on what he has done when he became a human being on your behalf representing the human race. That's what he says. Nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Here come the Jews. Oh, we must go to the Jewish thing. We must go back to the Jewish thing. They start to see value again. But God did give the law to Moses. God did physically appear over there. It was God's mouth that says these things. And they sat with a mind between the law 
and grace. Meaning they're double-minded. So, what he says, a double-minded man. It literally me means they're a two-spirited man. The word spirit means a vital principle which is animated. I'm sorry for all the definitions, man, but, you know, our words lost its power. We need to explain what a word means. A spirit. If you're in the spirit of rugby, it means the whole atmosphere, the attitude of it gives you your life. It means it determines what you wear, it determines your, when you laugh and when you don't laugh, because you're in the spirit of rugby. In the same way here he says, a two-spirited man, a man who's got two principles that gives him life, is unstable in all his way. He's got the law principle, or the spirit of the law, and he's got the spirit of grace, both of these spirits in one human body. Now you go and ask God for wisdom with this two-spirited thing. He says, you will not receive from God. Not because God says, I will not give to you. God gives, but what you receive will be a mixed thing. I hope you understand what I'm saying. You will not receive from God. That's not so God say, God will not give to you. God speaks all the time. His wisdom is written down in a book, man. His wisdom, Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God concerning you. His gospel is being preached Amen. So God gives His wisdom all the time. But you, when you're double-minded, you will not hear what God says in that situation. So we can't, can't be too spirited. Amen. So when you ask, He says, for a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we are single-minded. The Bible says, let your eye be single. Isn't it? Because if you look in two ways, you know, your whole body will be full of darkness. What does darkness talk about? It talks about the condemnation of I'm not good enough, I can't qualify, how can the gospel be preached to the poor, how can I be called to blessed? I thank God that I preach in Africa. You know, when I listen to a message that comes from somewhere else in the world, I, the first thing I think is, I'm going to preach this to people in the Africa bush that's never heard the gospel, that's never seen a car or seen money. And can this thing which this person preached work for those people? If it can't work, I know it's not the gospel. If you say flying a big jet is the blessing of God, they don't even have a runway. Okay. I let me have a donkey car, my man. Hmm? I've got nothing. Now you want to come with that gospel to those people. You'll ruin their peace. They are, I want to tell you, if we take some of the gospel we preach, those people believe in a God with, with the name Nyambi in Western Zambia. I'm not saying for eternity, but for peace in this world. It's better never to preach the gospel that's preached in many places, not to preach it to them because it will destroy their lives. They've got peace. It's just that the knowledge of innocence is not there. The knowledge of I'm loved by God is not there. Still working for God like all other religions. So the wisdom of God is something that gives you peace in the situation you are in. The, the Bible says, let the poor say, I am rich. It doesn't say, let the poor say, I will become rich. Meaning, I am rich. In my poverty, I am rich. Because there's a different wisdom. There's a different application of truth. Wisdom is the correct application of truth. Jesus is the truth. The correct application of truth will, a poor man, which will be poor in this world standard forevermore, will smile this big because he says, I am rich. And it will not just be a spiritual thing that he says to get God to be happy because he said, I am rich while he was poor, so now he deserves a blessing. So many times we will just say, well, Lord, I'm rich because of Jesus. But in the back of our minds, we've got this law system of, if I can just convince God that I'm really thinking, I'm rich now, then one day I'm going to get something. Listen, God's going to give to you anyway. He loves you. You know, Jesus, 
fix the problem with the with the, with the people with a with a poverty mentality in uh, Matthew six. He said, and I've, I, I think I say this every service. It blesses me so much, not because I don't think you don't hear it. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they? So what makes you make use of what God has given? Your revelation of your own worth. Amen. Amen. So we don't read the Bible to see how we are slaves. We read the Bible to see our sonship, our friendship with God our godliness, our definition of who we really are. Paul said, this thing I do know. I don't know what we will be when Jesus returns, but this I do know, we'll be exactly like Him. So you've got the one definition about your life, the life Jesus is your life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Right. I'm going to pray for you guys. Um, if, you've got a, if you're going through a hard time, uh, financially or in a relationship or something and you need wisdom I want to pray for you right now you know obviously it's not enough space here um, but just stand up you know if you want I would like to pray for you don't be ashamed and uh, we're going to just stretch our hands forward to you and uh, I believe that the Lord is going to just uh, give you that wisdom you know in that situation amen everybody here let us just agree together with these people <clears throat> I just felt Yesterday that I need to talk on this for people and that they need this and that in their mind Wisdom will be there for them Father I want to come and as a congregation We stretch forth our hands to the people that stand here right now and even to the people watching over the web that's going through hard times maybe in relationships finances um, Whatever it is business just the things of this world and they need wisdom Father, I thank you that we can come to you today single-minded, in faith, the full persuasion of what Christ has done for us. And we know that whatever advice you give is not based on the past, but it's based on the present Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. I thank you, Lord, that these people in their minds, uh, the first thing, I thank you, God, that contentment just takes over. Those of them that already walk in contentment, I thank you, Father, that uh, the, the provision for it, the wisdom on, on what to do, the, the emotion in their heart, the idea comes forth based on the finished work of Jesus, not based on, I need to get a job to say I'm the blessed of God. Not based on, I need to have more money or a good relationship to say I'm the righteousness of God. With a self-worth already intact, we come to you because of what you've done. And thank you, Lord, that we declare and we ask of you desires to come forth and to show these people the way they need to go. In Jesus' mighty name. I declare them blessed. People over the web, I declare you blessed and loved by God in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. I, I wanted just to let the peace of God, you know, it's just a thing, a thing of it's settled. God gives liberally. He will. He gives it to you. Where we put our trust not in when it's going to happen, but in the person of God. Who He is, a loving God who adores us. And just let that burden fall from you by that revelation of His unconditional love. Whew. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Right, that is it. If anybody needs prayer, you can, you can come afterwards. Those of you that want to support the work we're doing here, there's a, a, a red box on the table. You can give some money if you like. And then if you want to order the CD or DVD, please uh, write it down that we can, we can give it to you next Sunday.